play a blues and see if you don't hear them doing things that I'm doing on here, because everybody does it. Jazz or bossa novas are usually played in 4-4 time, although we can play in 3-4. When jazz players play slow songs, we usually call those ballads. The jazz repertoire is usually made up of blues, ballads, standards. Those are songs that usually originated in Broadway shows in New York City, and there's thousands of standards. <clears throat> then there's the jazz standards. Those are songs that jazz players have written and have become popular in the jazz community. And then there's original songs, songs that uh, maybe I write, or maybe you write, and you play them in your hometown, or with your combo, your jazz band, maybe at school, and those are called originals. Maybe nobody outside your family ever hears you play those tunes, but you like to play on the harmony and the melody. So the repertoire for jazz musicians is pretty big, pretty big. But usually things are played in 4-4 four, four, or in 3-4. Now, if you're in another country, like South America, say, maybe Brazil, you might play in 7-4 or 9-4, different rhythms. If you go to China or Japan or Israel or other countries, you're going to play in different time signatures. You're also going to use different scales. They're not going to use major scales and minor scales like we do in the Western world. But the jazz tradition for the last 80 years or 90 years has been based on major, minor, dominant seventh, half diminished, and the blues scale. And those sonorities or those qualities make up the basic component of jazz. The jazz musician likes to play things fast. It's always been a challenge to, to see if you can finger on your instrument, whatever instrument you play, the ideas that you hear in your mind. And since we're talking about the creative art or the, the creative aspect of your imagination, there's no end to what you can think. And if you're constantly listening to records, CDs and so forth, or maybe live performances, it, it spurs you on and you say, gee, Wonder, wonder if I could do that, and you try it. And as you try that, then your imagination shows you other things to do. So we end up trying to play fast, but we also play very slow, and we play tempos in between. There's really no jazz tempo, but the better jazz musicians have recorded things at very slow tempos, and also very fast. So they've set the parameters for the jazz players, and all of us that come along after the great jazz masters and try to play. We practice a lot of times with a metronome, very slow, and then very fast. If you can play things fast, you can usually play them at any of the slower tempos. So if you're working on your scales and your cards or any type of exercise, don't practice them slowly forever. You're wasting your time. Practice them slowly, then tomorrow, a little faster. The next day, a little faster. Get them moving so they sound like what you hear in your mind. Don't waste your time perfecting every little thing. It'll come in time. I feel that having some keyboard knowledge is important for everybody, even though you're not a keyboard player. Nowadays, you can go out and buy these small Casio, Yamaha keyboards for $100 or less. Put your earphones in, learn voicings, maybe learn the blues scale, learn some major scales. I think learning two and three note voicings are very important for everybody. They help you to learn songs very quickly. For instance, if I'm playing, uh, let's say I'm going to play uh, Summertime. The chords. I just played through summertime quickly. I was thinking the melody in my head. I just played two notes in the right hand, the third and the seventh. The third and the seventh are the two most important notes of any scale. Once you have your root, if you play the seventh and the three, everybody knows what the sound is. It gives you the whole scale. I recommend for everybody that you learn simple two and three and four note voicings for whatever song you're going to play. And I think it, you'll find that it's quite uh, entertaining to yourself because especially if you're like a trumpet player or, or a saxophone or trombone flute where you're, you're, you're only playing melody, all of a sudden your left hand can play a chord and your right hand makes you feel more like a musician. As an example, let's take the blues off of the volume one. I've cut the piano channel out. That's the right channel. We're only going to listen to the bass, Rufus Reed and the drummer. Jonathan Higgins, and they're on the left channel. I'm going to play two note voicings for the first chorus, 12 bar blues in B flat. The second chorus, I'll play three note voicings, 
and the third chorus I'll play four note voicings. And I think you'll see that they're very simple, but yet they give you the feeling and the flavor, the texture of the blues. One, two, three, two note voicings. One, two, three, four. I've got the blues memorized. If you don't have it memorized, you have to look at it in the booklet. Now that was the first course. Here's the second course. Three notes. Doesn't that sound like something you've heard before? C minor. F7, B flat 7, F. Now let's go to four notes. Typical jazz rhythm. Bop, bop. C minor. There are some very good books to learn jazz voicings. I'd like to mention several of them. Dan Hurley has several books. His last name is H-A-E-R-L-E. -E. He teaches at the University of North Texas in Denton, Texas. Another one is by Frank Mantooth, a very good book on voicings. Mark Levine in San Francisco has a very good book out called Jazz Piano. I've got several transcribed piano voicings off of the play-alongs. For instance, the volume 50 play-along has all of the piano transcriptions that, uh, that Mark Levine plays on that play-along are in a booklet and are available. Uh, the volume one that I've been using today, the one we just listened to, all of my piano comping on there has been transcribed and put in a booklet. Uh, the volume 55 Jerome Kern book with Hal Galper, all of his comping is in a booklet. And there's several others that you can get too. That way you can actually see what these people are doing and take your pencil and analyze it. I encourage you to do that. One of the biggest problems I've found with beginning improvisers is the lack of songs. In other words, they don't take the time to learn an actual melody in addition to the cards and the scales. So when it comes time to play at a jam session, someone says, what would you like to play? And they don't know what to play. They usually end up playing a B flat blues or an F blues. In the volume one booklet, I've got a, a page that tells you about, oh, 15 beginning songs, some intermediate songs, and some advanced songs. And I'll show them to you right now. You want to learn the blues in B flat and in F. And these are the different play-along records that they're on. You can see we've recorded the blues a lot. Footprints by Wayne Charter is in C minor, and it's on two of the play-along records. Satin Doll by Duke Ellington is in the key of C, and it's on two play-along records. Doxy, Autumn Leaves, Impressions, or So What, Summertime, Blue Bossa, Song from My Father, Maiden Voyage by Herbie Hancock, Silver Serenade by Horace Silver, Cantaloupe Island by Herbie Hancock, Sugar, by Stanley Turrentine, the famous jazz saxophonist, and Watermelon Man by Herbie Hancock. A lot of these songs right here, the beginning songs, are on the volume 54 Maiden Voyage play along. And I urge you to get that one, practice the scales and chords, and also go out and buy recordings, or listen to the radio, or go to the library and get the music. Hear what these songs sound like so you know before you play what they're supposed to sound like. Now in the intermediate song area, Four by Miles Davis, Perdido by Duke Ellington, all Blues by Miles Davis, Groovin' High by Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Softly as in a Morning Sunrise, that's a standard tune. Green Dolphin Street, that's a standard tune, 34 measures. Misty by Errol Garner, that's a standard, but it's not a difficult standard. Just Friends, that's another standard, and there's many, many more. And again, we tell you the keys that they're in and the play-along records that they're in. And on this page here, if you see something like this, that means on the tune four, that the concert key chord progression, F sharp minor to B7, is probably the most difficult part of that song. So you can see each one of them has a little section that you need to pay attention to. 
Now, if we move down to the advanced songs, like Stella by Starlight, Star Eyes, Invitation, Have You Met Miss Jones, I Got Rhythm, we play that in all 12 keys. Some people do. It's usually played in B flat and F, of course. Giant Steps by John Coltrane, John, Joy Spring by Clifford Brown. All the Things You Are is a standard. And most ballads, that's the slow tunes. Wayne Shorter tunes, Horace Silver tunes, John Coltrane tunes, Benny Gulson tunes, and thousands of other songs make up the jazz repertoire. But I strongly suggest that if you're watching this video, that you make it a point to learn one or more of these beginning tunes in the next month or two or three, okay? Play them with the play-along. Get friends over to your house and play with the play-alongs. Get together at school or after school with a drummer, a bass player, a guitar player, a piano player. Pass out the music to these tunes and play them so you really know what it is you're playing. And then, of course, as a reminder, memorize the melodies to the tune. Memorize the chord progressions. So when you walk down the street, you can say Cantaloupe Allen, F minor, four bars, D flat seven, four bars. D minor, four bars, F minor, four bars. Or you might say something like uh, four by Miles Davis, concert key, E flat, E flat major for a bar, E flat major for a bar, E flat minor for a bar, A flat seven for a bar, F minor for a bar, F minor for a bar, A flat minor for a bar, D flat seven for a bar. That's the first eight measures right there. Commit it to memory, internalize it. And then of course, memorize the various scales on the cards. For instance, take Cantaloupe Allen as an example. F minor, four bars. The scale is F, G, A flat, B flat, C, D, E flat, F. The ninth chord is F, A flat, C, E flat, G. Second chord scale, D flat seven, concert key. D flat, E flat, F, G flat, A flat, B flat, C flat, D flat. The ninth chord, D flat, F, A flat, C flat, E flat. The third chord for Cantaloupe Allen, D minor. D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D. That's an easy one. The chord, the ninth chord, D, F, A, C, E. And the last one is F minor, and I already said it. I know my scales and my chords for Cantaloupe Allen, and you should learn them too. I think oftentimes when jazz musicians start to practice, they say to themselves, oh, well, I'll not practice right now. I'll uh, Go get me something to drink. I'll go watch TV. I'll go to bed. I'll call a friend. Maybe go visit a friend. I'll do it tomorrow. What we're doing at that point is we're battling with our ego and our ego wins. The ego is that part of us that wants us to stay exactly like we are. When it senses that you want to improve yourself and to learn things, that's when it says, relax, you're okay just like you are. I think traditionally the jazz musician has taken the ego and put it up on the shelf and has said, I know there's things I don't know, and the only way I'm going to get better is to work on them. So they dive in, and they practice whatever needs to be practiced. They sharpen their ears. They sharpen their technique and their facility. They listen to recordings constantly. They study books. They study transcribed solos. And what happens? Six months later, they sound much better. A year later, they sound a lot better. It is said that Charlie Parker, the famous jazz saxophonist that died in 1955, his nickname was Bird. It is said in his own words on a taped interview with Paul Desmond, the saxophonist that played with the Dave Brubeck Quartet for years, Charlie Parker told Paul Desmond that he practiced 11 to 15 hours a day for three to four years. Now, when I heard that tape probably five years ago, maybe 1988, 89, when I heard that tape, I said, oh, wow. That means that Charlie Parker became a great musician because he practiced. I think in my mind, my ego had always said that Charlie Parker was a great musician, but he was born with that talent, that God gave him that talent at birth, and that's why he was so good. But when I listen to him talk on that interview and another one, I understand, no, Charlie Parker was just like everybody else. He didn't know anything when he started. As a matter of fact, in his own words, he went out and played a, a set in with a band one night, and the band was playing very slowly, body and soul. He's playing two other melodies, Up a Lazy River and Honeysuckle Rose, which has nothing to do with the song the band was playing. He didn't even know that when you 
played a song with the band that you were supposed to play the same song. Now, when I heard that recording, probably 15 years ago, I said, oh, wow, maybe Charlie Parker did start just like all the rest of us. So I tell you this little story just to remind you that the greatest people are great because they work hard. And you can excel in the area of jazz if you work hard too. But listening is a key thing. If I wanted to leave one thing with you on this videotape, I like my best advice, it would be listen to the jazz masters. Listen to the jazz masters. Every question you have can be answered on the recordings if you learn to listen to the answers. If you are a teacher and you're teaching the basics of whatever instrument you play and whatever instrument you teach, I strongly suggest that you play your instrument along with the student. If you're using the volume one or the volume 24 or the volume 21 play along recordings and you're encouraging your students to learn their scales and their chords and their fingerings and, and get good sound on their instrument and play musically, I strongly suggest that you give them an example and play along with them because they can learn from your sound and from your technique and from your imagination. The fourth note of a major scale and the fourth note of a dominant seven scale has a lot of what we call inherent tension. It's just there. And if you play that note against the chord, like you start a phrase on it or you end a phrase on it, it's really gonna sound strange. Let me play, C major. Here's the fourth. I think your ear can tell that that note needs to be moved to another note. What we usually do is put that note in the middle. We use it as a passing tone. That's the fourth. Now listen, I'll play the third, the fourth, and the fifth. Sounds okay that way. I'm playing the third on the downbeat, and the fourth comes on an upbeat. That's the weak part of the beat. And when we play it on the upbeat, our ear says, oh, that's fine. But if you play the fourth on the downbeat like this, your ear goes, oh, what's happening? We never sing that way. It's very difficult to sing wrong notes. It really is. It's easy to play them because we don't know what we're playing or what key we're in. But when you play, if you emphasize the third and the fifth on the downbeat and let the fourth come on the upbeat, you'll sound like professional musicians. Let me give you an example. I played the fourth twice and it always came on the upbeat. Now, that was major. Here's dominant seventh. It wants to come down. Sometimes on dominant sevenths, we raise them up a half step. And that becomes a Lydian dominant scale. C, D, E, F sharp, G, A, B flat, C. Very pretty sound. So in that case, on the dominance, the jazz player has learned that if they raise it a half step, they come up with a brand new scale. And it was a very popular sound in bebop. Ninth, sixth, F sharp in the key of C, A, C. Very pretty sound. I strongly recommend that you try to memorize everything. Memorize your chords and your scales. Memorize the melodies to the tunes. Memorize the lyrics if you have them. If you can, that might help you to play the melody. Maybe even memorize some solos. Uh, for instance, if you're playing Four by Miles Davis, do you have the original recording? When you're playing it, can you actually hear some of Miles Davis' solo going on in your mind? And maybe at times you'll play bits and pieces of it. If so, I'm sure there'll be listeners, if they're used to listening to jazz, and they'll recognize it and they'll like you for, them, for it because it's like you're playing a part of them. They know that solo, you know the solo. Here, here's a part of it. So I highly recommend that you memorize everything. And oftentimes you can memorize some of the basic material away from your instrument. Maybe when you're lying in bed at night trying to get to sleep and you can't, lay there and think through the chord progression to the blues and then try to spell each of the scales. Or maybe pick another tune, maybe a standard, or maybe just eight measures of a song. Take small sections things that you can digest and feel good about. Pickup notes are very important in jazz. They help start your phrase, they let the listener know exactly where the beginning of the uh, section is, and they help delineate the time. Let me give you an example of a couple pickups. Didn't you know that was the beginning? Let me play several pickups 
I'll put a left hand bass line in it. I'll just play kind of a turnaround figure in the key of F. Watch how many different pickups I play. One, two, one, two, three. pickups. That one's a little longer. to the first note of the first measure. There's thousands of pickups. ones, one note pickups. But it lets the listener know exactly where you are. Pickups lead. Pickups lead. And many beginning improvisers do just the opposite. They let the rhythm section go and then they start to play rhythm section place and then you start. Don't be one of those people. Be a person that knows exactly where the time is. When you hear, if you're playing with a play along and you hear the count of one, two, a one, two, three. When you get to about beat three, play something. One, two, three, ba do bo bam. And one of the simplest things to play is five to one. Five, six, seven, eight, and eight is one. Or just five to one. Five, one, but play it one, two, three, five, one, and play it with energy and enthusiasm. Let the listener know that you know exactly where you're at. Pickups are very important, and you don't play them just at the beginning of a song. You can play them at the beginning of almost any phrase because our music is based in, built in two, four, and eight bar phrases. So every two bars, you can really use pickups if you want to. Again, looking at some transcribed solos would be valuable for you. Everywhere I go, people ask me, what play-along record should I buy first? Which one should I practice first? And I always say, well, which ones do you have? Now, if they don't have any, here's what I recommend. If they're a beginning improviser, I'd start with volume 24, major and minor. The reason for starting with it is, it's very easy. We started out the video with that, the B-flat major scale. It's a bossa nova, and I found that playing bossa nova relaxes the left side of the brain. That's the side that does the thinking. That's the side that fear resides in, incidentally. That's the side that says, uh-oh, Let's not improvise because we're not prepared, okay? Well, the major and minor, volume 24, coupled with the bossa nova, I found helps people to relax. It allows them to play their scales and enjoy practicing scales and cards. Plus, it gets them into improvisation and being creative with the scales. And usually what happens is they say, oh, wow, I'd like to play some more scales. So they try a different track. And the next thing you know, after several months' time, maybe they've played through all 12 major keys and enjoyed doing it because they're improvising with it. Now the next one, as far as learning the basics, is called Getting It Together. This is volume 21. It's a two CD set, or two record set, or one cassette, and it's a pretty big book. We've got 30 different tracks on it, 31 tracks. Each one of the tracks, with the exception of the last two, go through all 12 keys. It's very thorough. It's not the play-along that you want to buy to improvise with if you're a beginner, because it'll be very frustrating for you. But if you realize the need for practicing your scales and your cards in the different keys, and also major, minor, dominant seven, half diminished, uh, Lydian, uh, diminished, whole tone, harmonic minor, and melodic minor. I think those are the ones that are on there. And then we have the blues in F and the blues in B flat. 
If you're interested in practicing those scales and hearing those sounds, volume 21 is for you. The tempos are not fast. The music's all written out in the book. The scales are written out. And it's very easy once you understand what it is you're supposed to do. After that, I suggest volume one. This is the one that has most of my thoughts on beginning improvisation. But for beginning improvisers, very beginning, I think maybe the volume 24 and the volume one work well together because you can read about how to improvise here and apply it on the simple scales here. And then as you gain some knowledge, you can start to play the blues on here or maybe the three scales that start out the very first track or the second track and kind of get your feet wet, so to speak. And then from there, you can go to any of the ones that you feel like you can play. Volume 54, I highly recommend because the temples are slow and the songs are always played at jam sessions. We put that package together, especially for the beginning improviser. After you've been improvising for a month or two or maybe six months and want to learn some tunes, volume 54, Maiden Voyage, is probably the one for you. In addition to your major, your minor, your dominant seventh, your half diminution, your blues scales, there's another scale that jazz players love to play. It's called the bebop scale. Here's what it sounds like. And oftentimes it's played from the top to the bottom and back up because that's the way it's played. Very pretty sound. Now that was over a dominant seventh. Six, lowered seventh, major seventh, and the root. The added note is the major seventh, and it doesn't sound very good, but you always play it on the upbeat, on the ands. One, and, two, and, three, and, four, and, one, and, two, and, three, and, four, and. That was Dama seventh. Over the uh, major, The added note, the B, all the bebop scales are eight note scales. On the major, we add the sharp five in between the regular fifth and the sixth. One, two, three, four, five, sharp five, six, seven, one. And again, you wanna make sure that the sharp five always occurs on the upbeat. Now, if I, I started on E, and came down to E and went back up. Now listen, I'll start on D. And by starting on D and playing eighth notes, it forces the G sharp to come on a downbeat. See what you think it sounds like. Can you hear that that isn't singable? That's not something that you would naturally sing. So if you start on the third, works fine. Start on the fourth, it doesn't. Crunches again. Fifth. Seventh, I'm sorry, doesn't work on the seventh because we're putting it on the downbeat again. You have to start on the root. For minor, we add the major third, the worst note. If, if you wanted to make sure that nobody liked the note you played, play a minor card with a major third. People, they say, that are tone deaf, that can't hear anything, can hear that sound, and they all go, ugh, what's that? Okay, we're gonna add that note to the Dorian minor scale and make it the bebop scale that fits over minor. play the bebop. David Baker has several very good books on the bebop scale, patterns, how to use them, how to fit them into your playing. 
It's a sound that players have played for years. So it's a very common sound. We don't have the time on the video to go through all of the different patterns and things you can play, but basically you take your regular patterns, add that one note, and make sure you play it on the upbeat. And again, listening to transcribed solos and reading them in a booklet and analyzing them can give you some information on how the jazz masters have done it in the past. In closing, I'd like to read something here that I've prepared. Practicing. Practicing should not be thought of as a chore because it's an opportunity to gain mastery over the tools that you'll need in order to improvise and, at the same time, enjoy what others are playing. You'll be able to hear what they're playing. Always play what you hear in your head. Let your mind be the creator 